The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Easy PBI, yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk specifically about the PBI or push button installer format, but I'm going to focus specifically on creating your own push button installer packages and even how to manage them if, for instance, you're a small business and want to have your own little repository of packages that you maintain. I'm going to show you how to do all of that here in this coming talk. So I'm going to start with just doing a quick summary for, of the PBI format for those of you who don't know what it is. Uh, I'd like then to go on and talk about uh, actually PBI creation. There are two main parts to that, uh, building a module and then building the actual star.pbi file itself. After that, um, we would like to do PBI management. This is, again, as I said, what if you're a small business and there are five programs that you really, really want everybody in your company to run and you want the absolute bleeding edge versions of these packages. You can maintain that yourself and build them yourself as soon as they're updated and I'm going to show you how to do that and push them out so that all the people in your company can get a hold of them. Next, and finally, I'm going to talk about Easy PBI. This is a program that I helped co-create, and it just makes it extremely easy to build PBIs on your local system so that you don't need to worry about some you know, all-powerful distribution center waiting for them to finally release the proper version of the program X that you are looking for. You can build it yourself, and it shouldn't take all that long, and it should be really, really easy. And that's the purpose of Easy PBI. So I'll give you a brief run through on that, and then if we have time at the end, I might also demonstrate how to use it. So first, let's go through the PBI format. Let's just do a quick summary of this. First off, the PBI format is system independent. By this, I mean it, aside from the dependencies required from running FreeBSD in the local system, which currently that is the main uh, dependencies, PBIs do not interact with any other packages that you have installed in your main system. It doesn't matter what window managers you are running. It doesn't matter what desktop environments. As long as you have that base FreeBSD installation, PBI system will work completely independently. So there is a PBI framework that will depend on the local system as well, but then each individual PBI itself does not depend upon any of the other PBIs. The reason for this, the PBI format specifically contains not only the program that you're interested in, but also all necessary dependencies for that PBI into one small package. The, well, sometimes it's small. <laughs> As you'll see, some packages can get quite large when you wrap up all the dependencies themselves. But the reason for this is once you have that one package, that PBI, you can then transfer it to any system that you want. It doesn't need to have an internet connection. You don't need any kind of outside external influences on that system. And you can install this PBI to your system. It will go into its own directory under the PBI format. It does not interact with the rest of your system, as I mentioned earlier. All of the things in that directory, it's everything it contains, completely self-contained there which leads us to the next one. PBI number one, let's say it's application A. It has a dependency of, say, application B, and then a couple other libraries, libc, libd, all right? PBI number two, well, that might be application X. It might have a same, one of the same libraries as application A. For instance, libc is what I have here, but then additional libraries, libd, libe. 
each PBI contains everything that it needs. It does not care what other PBIs you have on your system. It doesn't even care what other PBIs are out there. Each of them is completely self-contained. When PBIs are installed, they actually utilize a system of sharing memory so that you are only running one copy of each library at a time. In order to accomplish this, when PBIs are installed into your system in this framework that we have here, there's actually what's called a hash dir inside that framework where the libraries are actually placed. Then through a system of hard links linked into the appropriate PBIs as needed. The PBI framework itself has a daemon that runs in the background, and it keeps track of this hash dir, removing any libraries or files that are no longer needed by installed PBIs. For instance, if you were to remove PBI number one here, which has libd number three, once you remove that PBI, you'll see that my other program doesn't depend on it. So the PBI daemon that is running in the framework will recognize that and remove and trim out any files that are no longer needed any there. However, what about libA.1? Both programs require that. So once it's removed from, if PBI number one is removed, libA.1 will still remain because it recognizes the inherent dependency from PBI number two. In order to keep that shared library, it really only keeps one copy on your file system. This means that while the PBI package itself, the single file that you can transfer around between computers, might be large, let's say the Firefox PBI, it might be 200 megabytes or so. Once you install it, however, it doesn't necessarily take up 200 megabytes or so of your hard drive space. It really depends on what you already have installed, and it will only move over the ones that it needs at that time, and then bump up how many applications are using the other libraries if they're already there. Another nice format thing about the PBIs is they're extremely easy to install and remove. Because they are kept separate from your main operating system, your main system, um, it doesn't really depend upon anything else there. So you don't have to worry about incompatible libraries or just version conflicts or anything like that. Um, so you can just add them, remove them, update them, all without worry of breaking anything else in your main system. In order to utilize adding them and removing them easily, there's two main methods you can do that. The first is via a CLI, command line interface command. Very simple, it's PBI underscore add, and then you give it the PBI file that you have. That will it, check the file for some security stuff, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then it will extract it onto your system and be done. That's simple. To remove it, exactly the same thing, PBI underscore remove, and then you give it the name of the PBI that's on your system. And it will go ahead and remove that and clean up all the dependencies and everything. So it's very simple to remove. And that's all via command line. But what if you don't want to run the command line? There is also a Qt GUI installer. So if you ever just double click on a PBI file from your desktop, it will open up this nice little interface, simple installer box. And basically, it's just a next, next, done. And that's all it takes to install. Nice, quick, easy, and simple. That's the way we like it. Now, I mentioned before there are some security methods built into the PBI system. The first of these is SHA-256 checksum verification. Whenever you download a PBI, it will actually compare the checksum for that file to the checksum that it should have. Um, that is the easy way to tell whether or not it has been tampered with before downloading, or uh, maybe it got corrupted during download, or something didn't get copied right. It's a nice way to check for that. An additional method of security that's available within the PBI system is actual digital key signatures using OpenSSL keys. Um, when somebody builds a PBI, you actually have the option to include a digital signature in that PBI that signs all the important files, so any scripts that would be run during installation or after installation, anything like that gets signed by this digital key, so that if the PBI is tampered with before you get a copy of it, it will fail these key checks to make and let you know that someone has tampered with this because it no longer matches. Those some files have been changed since the time it was built and you received it. So for instance, here is a quick PBI that I put together and I didn't put any signature in it whatsoever. 
and of course it failed the key checks. So it warns you right here during the GUI installer that there's no digital signature. Now you can, if you would like, go ahead and install it anyway. Generally not recommended unless you trust the source. In this case, I built it, so I trust myself. Um, from the command line interface, there is another way it also checks that. It, there, it will not necessarily give you the option to continue on. It simply stops and says, key check mismatch. You have to run it with an extra option to not check signature. And then you can install it. All right. So those are a couple of the nice security features that are built into the PBI format. Finally, what if you have that 200 megabyte Firefox PBI that you installed, but a new version comes out? It's really a pain to have to download another 200 plus megabyte version of Firefox just to get the latest version and reinstall it on your system. So P PBIs also utilize what we call binary patching. This is simply once you have two PBIs, say for two different versions of the same program, you can create a patch from the first version to the second version. That patch contains only the files that have actually changed within the PBI. So for instance, in an update of Firefox from you know, version whatever to the next version, there might only be like five files that have changed. In that case, your patch file could be easily under a megabyte or two. So this makes it much easier to keep your system up to date, keep your applications up to date without huge downloads, even though the initial download of a PBI might be larger than you expect for regular programs. OK, now let's move on. That was just a brief summary of the PBI format. Now let's actually talk about how to create your own PBIs. The PBI system actually consists of two different pieces. The first is what's called the PBI module. This is kind of like your roadmap or your, yeah, your roadmap basically for how to build the PBI. It contains all the instructions for what program you're going to build, what version is it, uh, what is the program author, does the program author have a website, you know, things like that. That's where you put all of the information that you need for that particular program and, and uh, application. You can also put in uh, custom graphics. That's where you would place any special icons that are used for the program. So for instance, the Firefox icon for a Firefox PBI. You all can also place uh, desktop and menu entries. These are the things that would appear on your desktop or in the, the menu on the sides so that you can just run the program easily without having to resort to the command line. And then finally, MIME types. If the program has specific, is specifically supposed to run for a particular type of extension, you can set that within XDG compliant MIME types as well. Once you have the module, which is fairly small and fairly easy to make, I'll show you an easy way to do it using Easy PBI later. Uh, then you can use the module to actually build the PBI. This is what takes up a bulk of your time because it runs and compiles your entire program plus all the dependencies for that program. So it might take a lot longer than just doing the program itself because it also has to go through and do you know, however many dependencies are there are for that program. However, once it is done compiling them all, sometimes, and in fact usually, there are a lot of dependencies for programs that do not necessarily need to be there for the program to run, simply for it to build. So for instance, some compilers and things like that. So what the PBIs do is it actually goes through and it cleans the packages afterwards to remove any programs that are not necessary for running the main program. This helps to shrink down the number of files and the, and the size of the initial PBI itself. And then finally, it compresses it all, again, to decrease the file size. And then it packages it as, as a PBI using everything else that you have in the module, like the icons, the menu, desktop uh, and menu entries, etc. Then it puts it all together in a nice format that can be used in red. All right, so let's talk about how to build modules, and specifically the module format first. Uh, the main thing that you would want is your pbi.conf. This is simply a shell configuration script that sets all the internal variables that are needed for a PBI. For instance, program author, program website, program name, program version, things like that. 
This is where you would set all of those. It's also um, where you would set what FreeBSD port. Uh, PBIs are easily created from FreeBSD ports using a few of these configuration options. And I'll go into more detail about this configuration file here in just a little bit. Second is the external links file. Some programs do not like being in a separate directory from your file system. In fact, they really won't run. So in that case, there is an external links file system, or external links file list. This is where you can put a list of any of those files that need to be symbolically linked into your hard system in order for them to run properly. The main files are still kept in their own directory, but you're basically tricking it into thinking it's in your main system. This might be useful if you have some kind of main binary you want to copy into slash user local bin or you have some kind of man page or whatever that isn't automatically detected, you can link it into the system man pages. Uh, the resources directory. This is the directory where you would put any extra files that you want included into the PBI. For instance, the icon file that you want to use. You just place it in the resources directory and that will put it in the base directory for the PBI when it's installed. Uh, XDG menu, that is the category where you would put your menu entry files, and then similarly, XDG desktop. That's where you put your desktop entry files. They're very similar, and I'll go into all of these here in the next couple slides. And then finally, XDG mime. That's where you put your XML mime type uh, configuration files. So let's go through some of the options for pbi.conf. First off, your program name. You set pbi underscore prog name equals, and then give it the name of your program. It's fairly easy. Next. You Prog web, that's what's the website for this? This means that when you're looking at the GUI installer for a PBI, you will notice that the name of the program author is highlighted. And by clicking on it, it'll immediately take you to the program website as well. Uh, pro PBI prog author, uh, prog icon. This is where you would tell it what icon you want to use. Usually, you give it the icon that you just put in the resources directory. PBI make port. This is one of the main ones that we use because this is if you want to link a FreeBSD port and convert, use that to convert into a PBI. Here you would just place whatever the particular port is that you're looking for. So for instance, Firefox in the FreeBSD ports category is in the www dir directory. So you would just put in this line uh, PBI underscore make port equals and then in quotes, www slash Firefox. And that would be, tell it which port it is that you wish to build. The port contains all the information that you need for what dependencies are required for Firefox to build, to run, and any additional libraries that it might need. The port contains all that information. So this is a very simple way to build a PBI from a FreeBSD port just by really using that one line in the pbi.conf. You don't need to set anything else. It will automatically pull the version of the program from the port. It'll automatically pull a lot of the other stuff it needs from the port. Uh, PBI underscore make port before or after. These are two options that you can use if, for instance, you find an error in a FreeBSD port. Say that you build Firefox, and when you try to run it as a PBI, it complains that it's missing some kind of library or dependency when you first run it. This is probably due to an error in the FreeBSD port itself. It might have something missing from its dependency list. So what you could do is you could add it, add that additional port that you need to build, either before or after the main port, to one of these lines. This is also an easy way to include extra plugins that you might need for specific programs. So for instance, uh, Emacs. If you, let's say you build a PBI for Emacs and you want to include one, uh, one or two of those numerous and wonderful Emacs p plugins, you could just add that, the port for that plugin to your make port after line, and it'll go ahead and build that and use that and include that in the PBI as well. So that when you install the PBI, it has Emacs plus all those plugins. Finally, you have PBI underscore make ops. This is where you want to set any specific make options or build options. FreeBSD ports generally have a very good set of defaults when you just want to build it. However, say there's some other option that's off by default, but you really want it, like some kind of security setting. 
you could go ahead and set it here and say, turn on this option. Usually it's with underscore, let's say SSL or something like that. With underscore SSL equals true. That's all you would need to put in here. And then when it goes through and builds the ports, it will automatically turn that option on when it comes to the port that needs it. OK, let's move on to external links file. In this one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can link some files from your PBI actually into your user local system. So here is basically just a quick list of some of the files that you would want to do. So for instance, if you would want to keep some kind of specific binary, bin foo, from your PBI directory, you put its location in the PBI into the first one, target directory. So a PBI directory slash bin slash foo is the one that you want copied. And it will link it into the local base in the directory called slash bin slash foo. And usually, the local base is slash user slash local. So in this case, PBI directory slash bin slash foo would be copied into slash user slash local slash bin slash foo. That way, if you just scan user local bin, you should be able to see application foo in there. And then you can also set some specific options for any links that you put into your system. One of them being, is it a binary? In other words, is it executable? Is it something that needs to be run? Keep. If it already exists in your local system, do you want to keep the old one, or do you want to replace the new one? Replace is another option. So usually, you only have one of those two. I don't recommend putting both. And then finally, there's an option there called no crash as well. PBIs also include the capability to open up some kind of crash handler in case the program has a problem and exits. It will actually display any errors that occurred or displayed to the command line in a crash handler. And here, if you want to, you can say, no crash. I don't want the crash handler to work with this, with this link. So it's a simple and easy way to link certain files from your PBI into your local system. Now, XDG desktop and menu entries. Uh, these are XDG compliant, which means they adhere to the freedesktop.org standards for menu and desktop entries. An example of a menu entry here is like this. You give it a type of an application. In this case, I'm saying it is program Opera, and I'm going to give it a generic name, Opera. And then you give it what the application, where the binary is that you're going to run for this desktop entry. In this case, you'll notice that we always put PBI, EXE, DIR, and then the binary. All right? That will automatically go and grab the directory that contains all of the executables for the PBI. And then you can just give it the name of the particular one that you want. For the path and the icon, you could just give it the apter instead. That gives it the base PBI directory. And it will look in there for anything else that it needs, because it can follow the hierarchical path within the PBI of libs, binaries, share, everything like that. Finally, if you have an icon, again, PBI apter. And then if you put the icon in the resources directory, it'll just be in the base. So you can just do slash the name of the icon. And then you can tell it whether you want to notify when it starts up. And for menu categories, you can give it network, for instance, because it's a web browser. So this is a very easy way just to keep desktop menu entries and actually build those into the PBI so that when somebody installs them, you can actually run a command to say, I want to put menu entries from the PBI onto my system. I want to put desktop entries. And in case the user ever removes them, they can just rerun that command and put them right back. All right, now let's move on to actually building the PBI. All right. There are many things that go into the PBI, but thankfully, within the PBI format itself, a lot of it has been simplified for you. You don't have to run every step of the command line, command tree yourself. There are just a couple simple commands in order to run them. First one, PBI make port. This is, like I mentioned earlier, an easy and simple way to convert a FreeBSD port into a PBI format. 
So for instance, this one, you give it a module. And if you have that PBI underscore make port line filled out in the PBI.conf, it'll use that, mod that port and convert that into a PBI module with all the listed dependencies, all the runtime dependencies that are listed in that port. PBI create. You do not need FreeBSD ports in order to build PBIs. Say you have an application that you've been developing yourself. In this case, you would just have it in some directory on your system, and you can say, I want to create and package that as a PBI. You can simply link it to that particular directory on your system and say, PBI create. Give me a PBI from everything in that directory. And in fact, in the PBI.conf, if you wanted to, I haven't tested this myself, but I think it'll work just fine for PBI underscore make port after. You could be able to add FreeBSD ports in there if you want to add some extra dependencies that you needed for your own program. It could still go through there and grab the FreeBSD ports for your dependencies, but not for the main program. So that's an easy way to use to actually convert your own programs and stuff into PBIs as well. Finally, what if you're a small business and you have a certain set of programs that you need to have all the time, and you just want to constantly build the latest version whenever there's a new version available? In that case, there's also a PBI auto build. This will basically search a directory for all the modules in that directory, and it will cycle through those modules, building them if there is updates available and if there's any changes to it. This allows you to just basically create a PBI build server. So you can put in any modules that you want, throw them in that directory, and it, your server will automatically go through and build PBIs whenever it can. I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about PBI auto build here in a moment, because that ties in directly to what happens if you want to manage a PBI repository. What if you were running your own build server and want to make it available for others? So let's give an example of how you would actually run PBI auto build. This is a simple, well, fairly simple command. It's a little long, um, where, for instance, the dash C, you can, then you can give it the directory where you contain all your modules. It will follow down through the path trying to find all the modules. Dash D, the alternate ports directory, say that you installed the FreeBSD ports on your system in a non-standard location. The standard location is slash user slash ports, but what if you put it in my home directory slash whatever slash ports or whatever? You can point it to that directory. Just as long as it knows where the ports directory is, it's fine. Uh, dash H, helper script. You can give it and write your own shell script to run at either after or before every single PBI build. So for instance, if you want to clean things up or move the files around, put them someplace else, you can put whatever you want in that helper script and that will run during the auto build, all right? Finally, the output directory with the dash O flag. Where do you want to put the PBIs once they're done? Do you just want to leave them in the directory of the module, or do you want to put them someplace specific on your system? Uh, dash dash gen patch. This is a simple way for producing the PBPs, or patch directory, patch files, to upgrade from version to version. If that flag is enabled, the PBI auto build will automatically generate the patches necessary if it looks in the output directory and sees the same program but different versions in there. It'll immediately generate the patches for those. Also, the dash dash keep numpbi. You can have it automatically clean how many versions of a particular program you want to keep. Because PBIs can get quite large, I don't recommend keeping over 150 versions of, say, Firefox if they're 200 megabytes apiece. By setting the number of PBIs you want to keep to, say, two, you only keep two PBIs around. Dash dash prune, that will actually, again, clean things up to, in order to minimize the amount of uh, hard drive that you're using afterwards. Dash dash TF, TMPFS, this is an option that allows you to actually use and save a lot of the builds, a lot of the compilations into your memory instead of onto the hard drive. Thus, instead of relying on read-write speeds to your hard drive, it can work much faster just by saving it in memory and recalling it. This is very, very useful for small programs, though it is not recommended for huge programs like OpenOffice, especially if you don't have a lot of memory on your system. So there's actually a flag that I did not mention earlier about the pbi.conf uh, 
where you can specifically set certain PBIs to not use TMPFS, even if this flag is enabled with your uh, auto build. That's an another way just to make sure that your PBIs will always build. Uh, what if you want to sign it with your digital signature? Well, we can do dash dash sign and then give it the file for your OpenSSL key identifier. Again, if you're running a build server and you're specifically building those PBIs for distribution to all sorts of people, you want to include that extra layer of security by digitally signing all of the files within your PBIs. Finally, as I mentioned before, if you want to distribute it, and generally when you run a build server, I would think that you are planning on distributing those PBIs. Uh, you want to make sure that somebody can get to them. Whoever you're, is supposed to get them will get them. As examples, we actually have for the PCBSD project, we have two different er areas that you can get to on the web. pbibuild.pcbsd.org for 32-bit PBIs, and pbibuild64.pcbsd.org for 64-bit uh, PBIs. This is simply where our build servers put the PBIs once they're done with them, as well as any relevant build logs and stuff. So if they fail, we can just open them up and see what happened, what went wrong. Now, the next step in the PBI management process is once a PBI is built, for the applications that are available in what we call the App Cafe, they are also, all of them are tested before they are actually made available in the App Cafe. In testing, what that involves is that we have to have a clean testing environment. What I usually do for this is what I have as the example. I use VirtualBox to create a virtualized installation of, in our case, PCBSD. And I specifically include the absolute bare minimum, bare bones install so that I can test a PBI and make sure that it isn't trying to use some files in the local system that aren't included in the PBI or that should be included in the PBI, just to make sure that they really are including absolutely everything right there. So that's the first thing that I recommend. Second, then you go through, you download the PBI from wherever your build server is, and then you run it. And the things that you generally look for are, first off, do the binaries actually work? <laughs> that's always the number one thing. If the program doesn't actually run, it's not worth it. And you got to fix the module in some way to try and tweak it, either adding packages or changing things. Sometimes we have to write uh, our own wrapper scripts in order to start the programs to get them to work properly. In that case, you always want to check that. PBIs are usually installed in slash user slash PBI, and then the name of the PBI dash the architecture, either AMD64 or i386. And then the actual binaries that you want to run are actually in the hidden sbin folder inside there. The main binaries are located in slash bin, but we actually can create some, automatically generate some wrapper scripts or create a generic uh, C binaries in order to run these. And we place all of those inside that hidden sbin folder. So that's where all the main binaries are that you would want to run. Other things you want to check are the icons files there. If you're, instead of adding your own icon file and instead of using one that was already included in the program somewhere else, like slash share, slash Firefox, slash, you know, whatever it is, icons, 36 by 36, whatever it is, um, you always want to check the icons just to make sure that the program didn't move around where all their icons are and stuff like that. So that's why I generally use uh, static linking for the icons and just throw it in the resources directory so that I know that that one icon file is always in the same spot every time. So I don't have to worry about them shuffling things around in the main program for, on me. And then again, desktop menu entries. If you specifically set for there to be desktop and menu entries in your PBI, you'll want to make sure that those are working properly. Are they linking to the proper binary? Did the binary name change without you realizing it? So you just want to make sure that some things like that are all working properly. And that's all that goes into our PBI testing process. We generally don't test. We aren't experts on every single program that comes out of the App Cafe, but we run it just for some simple checks. Does it work, that being the main one? Next step, and this is the hardest step. What about the approval process? Once you have the PBIs built and you've tested them and you're satisfied that they work to your satisfaction, what do you do with them then? This is what we call the approval process. So first off, we create the patches. 
if you're using the auto build command, you might not have to do this. It might already be done for you. All right. If you aren't, you can generate those patches yourself using the pbi underscore make patch command. You can give it the output directory with the dash o flag. You can, again, consign it with your OpenSSL key. And then you say which two PBIs you want to make the patch between, the old PBI and the new PBI. And it'll make a patch from one to the other. The next thing is that when you are running some kind of repository, there is what is called two Well, there are two files that are important for managing that repository. The first refers to meta information. This is the term that we use for kind of displaying all the relevant information about a particular program, not necessarily a particular PBI. So for instance, you would say what category this PBI would fall under. Let's look at the first one, PBI underscore meta tool add dash dash cat. So here you can add different categories of PBIs, similar to the way that uh, FreeBSD has different categories for all their programs, such as the www directory, where most of the web browsers are. So here you can add the category, give it a description with the dash D flag, give it a name with the dash N, give it a special icon, you know, grab the, grab the application's icon and throw it in there, and then you say, okay, where's the meta file? And it'll point that to it and add that entry to the meta file. Uh, similarly, that's just a category. What if we wanna add the particular application? If this application has never been on your repository before, you're going to have to add an entry for that actual program itself. And there's, this is the tool for that, PBI underscore meta tool add dash dash app. And then there are a number of additional options that go into applications. For instance, author, category, what category it's in, the description of the particular PBI, the icon, any keywords, so that when people are searching for programs and applications, they might not always type in Firefox if they're looking for the Firefox PBI. Let's just say they're just doing a general search for web browsers. So you might type web browsers in for keywords so that when people search for that, this will come up under there as well. Uh, what particular license is this program under? So for instance, the BSD license or the GPL license. Here you can actually display what licenses are there. Even commercial licenses, you just, that's what it's there for. Uh, the name, the type of PBI. This is where you would put, well, is it a command line only program? Is it a graphical utility? Is it a server? There you can display what different types of programs are so that when people, are, again, are just browsing through your repository, they can see a particular program is a particular type. Um, how about the URL? What about the program website? Again, here you can just put their program website. And then dash R. This is an option. What happens if a program somehow does require access to the main system in order to install, say, a kernel module or something like that. In that case, it needs what are called root permissions, because most PBIs, because they're in a separate category, can be installed with just user permissions. You don't need to do sudo, you don't need to be running as root in order to install most of them. Occasionally, PBIs do require root permissions in order to perform the install process, VirtualBox being a good example of that, because it utilizes a number of kernel modules. So in order to install that one, what you would have to do in the meta is you would write, hit this dash R flag. That says that root is required to install this program properly. So instead of waiting for the person to actually download the PBI and try to add it in order to find out that they need to be root to install it, this simply says up front, this PBI needs to be root in order to install. And then finally, you give it the meta file again. So for managing your own repository, this is just a quick and easy way to make things easy to search your repository and easy to find whatever applications that you might be looking for with all of the relevant inf information for all the programs that you're supplying. Now, what about the specific PBI that you just built? The meta is great for just in general, this is the program, and this is the category. So for the specific PBIs that are available from a repository, we use what is called the index file. This is what constantly changes as to the actual PBI files that are available for distribution, available for download at that time. The, you can create or edit this index file by using the tool PBI underscore index tool add, just like meta tool add. Um, and here, you can specifically just point it to the PBI using, again, a set of flags. Dash B, do you have any other versions that you're specifically supplying patches to? 
as well. In that case, if you have somebody that already has it installed, it will display to them, if they have access to your repository, there are new versions of your program available, patch to particular version X. Uh, dash F, you give it the actual PBI itself. Dash K, again, how many PBIs do you want to keep on your distribution side of your thing? So you, let's say that you only want to have that single PBI available. You could put just you know, one in there, and it would keep one PBI file for you. Or you could put five. Say you want to keep the latest version of a PBI plus the previous four. Just in case one of them doesn't work and they specifically need a particular version, you can keep as many versions of each PBI that you need. Dash U, again, give it the URL on the distribution server to that particular PBI. So let's say that your distribution server is www mydistribution.com. You would not include that base in this URL, but you would put everything after that to get to the file. So it would be in, so for instance, the PBI directory slash www slash firefox.pbi. That would be the URL that you would put in there. You would just leave off the www.mycrepository.com part of it. And then finally, you give it the index file again. The last thing that you would want to do for PBI management is once all of that has been done, you then just simply need to make sure that those files are on your distribution server. So you'd want to upload the PBI, the any patches, and then the index and meta files to your distribution server as well. Then any users that are using your repository to keep track of what PBIs are available, what versions of each programs and stuff, they will automatically fetch and use and parse the index and meta files just to see what's available. They can use that using the built-in App Cafe program within PCBSD, and they can just browse and see, oh, well, this, this repository has PBI version one of application X available. So they can add in whatever repositories you want. You don't have to write your own front end for your repository. That's already done. You just need to create the repository and then add the index and meta files, and that's it. So once that's all done and up on your distribution server, you're done. It's up to everything else, the PBI format, to do the rest. Now, there are a few other tools that are also useful. So I just kind of threw them in here under a miscellaneous category. Let's say, for instance, well, how to create a repository file. If you're running your own repository, you can actually create a .rpo specifically for your repository, sign it with your OpenSSL key file again. That way, when they download the PBIs, they will check that signature with the signature from your particular repository to make sure that everything matches. And then you can also give it descriptions and keys. That way, when you're in a production setting, you create the .rpo, all that anybody else needs to do is they simply need to add the repository to their system, running PBI add repo. It's very easy to add different types of repos to your own system if you're running a PCBSD system. All you have to do is say, I want to add this repo, and my app cafe, the browser utility, will automatically be searching your repository then for any updates to PBIs. And it will keep that on file so that you can, they can get the PBIs from your servers and everything. So again, here would be some of the commands for how to do that. So for instance, making a repo, what's the name of your repository? You would give it a description. Uh, do you have a key? What's the base URL? That would be, for instance, the distribution server that you would have. In the example that I had earlier, www.myrepo.com. That would be the base URL. And then, do you have any mirrors for your distribution server? You could add a whole list of mirror URLs as well if you have a mirror system. Finally, what if you test a PBI, you approve it, you think it's working great, and then you have a couple people come to you and say, it's just not working properly. So you retest it and you find out, hey, they're right, I missed something during the testing. You can remove that file from the index in order so that nobody else is downloading a broken PBI to give you time to fix things and upload a new one, a fresh one. In order to remove things from the index file, you can do PBI underscore index tool and then do REM, just remove. You give it the architecture of the specific PBI, so for instance, I386 or AMD64. You give it, again, the PBI name. What's the program name for the particular PBI that you're looking for? 
what version of the PBI? What if you have multiple versions available on your system, on your uh, distribution server? And then, again, the index file, and it will remove that. This means that instead of having that file, say you had an earlier version of the same program, it will now display that earlier version as the one that is available for download, and anybody that had the broken version on their system will get a little update thing saying, warning, updates are available, and it'll regress them back to the older version that works if they choose to apply it. So this is a very nice way of keeping track and keeping things working in your repository, allowing you to remove anything that's broken or any errors that come up. For additional details on some of the additional tools, I mean, I didn't cover all of them, but those are all the main ones, but there are a lot of other little nice, fancy tools and utilities for the PBI system. And you can find a lot of them on the wiki page for the PCBSD project, uh, wiki.pcbsd.org, and then slash index.php, and then underscore PBI manager. Those are all the PBI underscore commands with a full list of what they do, how you can use them and stuff, and it just, a lot of information there. Now I'd like to move on and talk about Easy PBI just a little bit. In 2011, Jesse Smith had a program called Make a PBI that he kind of put together on his own using C. It was a command line utility, a quick script to kind of scan a port and try to convert it into a PBI, into a PBI module. He came to the list and emailed us with a quick example of what he called Easy PBI as something, a simple graphical utility for anybody to point to a FreeBSD port and say, I want a PBI out of that, and it'll automatically generate the PBI module for that, filling in all the necessary information from the FreeBSD port that it could. So I came on board with that. I saw the inherent use of it. This would make things incredibly easy for standard users to be able to create PBIs. You don't have to know all that format stuff that I just talked about if you just wanted to build something on your system. Even if you don't want to distribute it to other people and you just want to have a particular program in the PBI format so that it's completely separate from the rest of your system, you can now build it yourself using Easy PBI. So in December of 2011, he Jesse Smith handed control of Easy PBI over to the PCBSD team. Since then, I have continuously been updating it and improving Easy PBI to, to be version now 1.2, which is what I'm going to show you here in the next couple slides, and just show you how simple it has become to create a PBI in your own system. Even if you don't necessarily have root permissions, you can still create PBI modules and then send them to a root administrator in order to build them if you would like. So you can auto-generate those and send them off to whatever project to help them supply uh, PBIs. So this is the first page of Easy PBI when you start it up. It, it's quite simple. Um, you just, if you want to create a new module, you click the new module in the upper left uh, corner, and it will open immediately open up a file manager to the particular ports directory that it auto-detected on your system. It looks in a couple different places, standard place and user ports, and then there's also a way to install the ports tree directly in the, into your Easy PBI directory on your system. Easy PBI creates its own little directory in your home, in your home folder called Easy PBI. That's where it places any modules that it builds or any PBIs that it builds. By default, you can change where those outputs are if you want later. So once you select a particular FreeBSD port from hitting that button, it will automatically read that FreeBSD port and try to pull all the information it can out of it and put it here for you. So for instance, the port that I selected here was the www slash opera port. Say I want to build the opera web browser. It detected from the port that the program name was just Opera. You can change that if you want, edit it for capitalization or spelling or anything like that. Some ports have different numbers on the end as well, but it tries to be smart about how it detects the program name to keep those numbers off of it and everything. Um, program website, what was the website that was listed in the port? It tries to display all of this right away, so you don't need to look anything up. You can just run this and it'll immediately grab all the information for you. The thing that takes the longest about building a PBI module is this one, the icon. Most FreeBSD ports generally don't come with a simple icon for the program. 
you have to go find that yourself. So the majority of the time that it takes to build a PBI module really comes down to simply, OK, go find the icon for the particular program. Let's go get a PNG file for Opera, and we'll throw that in there. Once you have it, you can just hit Choose Icon, go to the directory where you would save that file, select it, and it will add, include that icon in your PBI as the default icon for the program. Um, and then you can also check, do you want to create desktop menu entries? Easy PBI will automatically scan the port, try to detect any of the main binaries for that program, and automatically generate your desktop and menu entries, putting them in, in this case, the network category for the menu and everything else. It'll automatically create all that for you. Once you are satisfied with the, num with the labels that are all here, you can, again, change any of these by hand if you would like. Um, you can just hit Create Module, and it'll create that module. It'll put it in slash your home directory slash EasyPBI slash modules, and it'll have the name of the program that you are trying to build. Now let's move on. It can actually build PBIs for you as well. You don't need to know all those fancy commands in order to build the actual PBIs on your system. You can simply build it here in the GUI. First thing at the very top, but this is your settings for building your PBI. The default output directory, again, is in your home directory, in my case, slash home slash Kenmore, slash easy PBI slash PBI. So once the PBIs are done, it'll just put them in that directory for me. You can also point it to a digital signature file. Generally, if you're just a standard user who's building a PBI for yourself, you don't need to give it one, and it won't do that. So you'll still get the little warning that there's no digital signature for the PBI, but you built it yourself. You don't care. <laughs> All right. You can also set it to use tempfs. If you have a lot of RAM on your system, generally four gigabytes of RAM is pretty good for most programs, except for, like I said, programs like OpenOffice or LibreOffice or something, something that's huge like that. I just hold off on using tempfs. But you can set all that. And if it's something, if you plan on building PBIs quite often on your system, you can hit the little Save button. It'll automatically save that configuration so that the next time you open up Easy PBI, it'll keep your defaults. It'll save those as your defaults for building PBIs. Finally, just select the, what module do you want to build. So in this case, I'm going to build the Opera module that was put in my home directory slash Easy PBI slash modules. That's where it automatically looks. You can just select which one by hitting the Select Module button. Finally, you hit Build PBI. Once all this is detected, you can click the Build PBI button. This will warn you that in order to build a PBI, you will need an active internet connection, and you will also need to supply your root password because it needs root permissions in order to build a PBI on your system. So if you agree and hit Continue, it will pop up GKSU to just ask for your root permission to switch user over to root. And then it will immediately run the PBI build process, displaying all the outputs from the build process here in this little box for you. While a PBI is building, you can click the Stop Build button. This will immediately stop the build, and it will try to clean it up a little bit. If it doesn't clean it up then, it'll clean it up the next time you try to build a PBI. It'll clean up any old directories where it was building PBIs. All right. So while this is working, however, it's actually working in the background of Easy PBI. You can continue to build PBI modules. You can continue to edit PBI modules, which is what the next thing I'm going to show you is. You can do all of that while you have a PBI building in the background. Once it is done, it will pop up a little window saying, build PBI build process completed successfully or unsuccessfully. All right. If it is unsuccessful, sometimes you might need some help actually you know, fixing your PBI module if it's out of your league or you just can't see it for some reason. In that case, you can save a build log. This will basically save everything that you have in this box so that you can send it to somebody else as a simple text file. This allows you to get help on building a PBI or tweaking the module to do what you need with it. Now let's go on to editing PBI modules really quick. Uh, some ol the older version of Easy PBI, which is version 1.0 in ports, does not have the capability to, to edit modules. This is something that is fairly new with version 1.2 in Easy PBI. This simply allows you to, again, check your pbi.conf file, in this case, 
and change anything, such as the program name, website, all the stuff that we talked about earlier with pbi.conf. Here, unlike the main create module page, though, you can also add additional ports. So for instance, if there are ports that are plugins for the program that you're building, you can come to the edit module editor and simply add those ports in here afterwards. Additionally, make options. One of the things that EasyPBI does when reading a FreeBSD port is it will automatically try to read what build options are actually set in that port or what ones are available. So it will display here a drop-down list of any of the options that are available for that particular port. And if you simply hit the up arrow, it'll immediately add that to your make options line. So you don't have to go and do the research to figure out what options are available for, for, for particular ports. EasyPBI is pretty good. It might not get all of them, but I'd say it gets about 90% of all the make options. And then finally, does it require root permissions? You can set that yes or no here as well. And then save it. And it'll save the pbi.conf in your module. Resources. Again, this is just a front end to the resources directory in your PBI module. What if you want to add a different icon for, say, you have two different binaries or a program that has two front ends, a server and a, and a client, and both of them have different icons or different logos? You can add as many files in here as you would need. Any PNG files that you have here actually will be linked in to all the rest of the editor when you're selecting icons for programs as well, any.png. So they're automatically detected by EasyPBI and say, oh, well, these are the available icons that you have for a particular, in this case, desktop or menu entry. Here it's very simple. You select your binary. EasyPBI tries to read and detect what the autom automatically what the binaries are that are available for a particular port. So you can select that or leave it as custom and write it in yourself. Say that uh, EasyPBI didn't detect it for some reason. You can just write in bin slash Firefox, and it'll do it. And then say, OK, what, do you, what label do you want? And then your icon and what menu category. The menu category, of course, is only used when you're actually creating menu entries. Finally, external links. What if you have external links that you want to do? Here you can just easily add them. Again. In the file list, it'll automatically list any binaries that are automatically detected. This is useful for text commands or whatever, things that don't have a graphical interface that you just want to run from the command line. You might want to link those into your local system, and you can do that here easily. Again, with all the options there of binary, no crash, so you just hit the arrow to add them in. All right, so that was a quick introduction to building PBIs, how to do everything on your own system, including easy PBI. Do you have any questions? The question was, are there any types of applications that are not good as PBIs in that format? And the answer is yes, there are some. One that I have run across is applications that aren't necessarily programs per se, but instead are like collections of PHP scripts that need to be installed into a web server. Those things I would rec generally recommend not making as PBIs because it doesn't include the server itself. So I would say leave those alone, install them as regular files into your server itself. All right, we've got just a few more seconds. Any more? Yes. The question was, is there a big push to convert FreeBSD ports into PBIs? And yes, there is. There are a number of people that send in huge batches of PBI modules created using Easy PBI, and we actively put those into our build servers to churn out PBIs for them. Well, thank you for your time. And thank you for coming. And I hope you have fun building PBIs and using FreeBSD. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that 
really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. 
These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.